me in a moment of silent prayer or reflection. This is funny. Here. 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 Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the Do I have a motion to review and accept the agenda for this session? So moved. Second. Yes. 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 Before we discuss the discussion items, I would like to welcome a special person in our uh, room today, and that is our future superintendent, Dr. Rebecca Stone. And she will be officially starting in July, but she has been able to be out here um, and started this week. And we did everything we could to make this as interesting of a time to transition as possible. So I, I hope we succeeded. <laughs> okay. okay. And then, Mrs. Sire, would you like to give us some updates on what our district is doing? Well, thank you. I actually um, appreciate you being willing to come in as we're practicing social distancing. Even though if somebody counted, they might get more than 10, we did try to keep everybody spread out. Uh, for me, it was important that the directors be here for this update. I do want to share, even before I get started, that we've been talking about this for a long time, have been doing some planning. Um, even prior to the schools being shut down, we had implemented a whole lot of uh, cleaning routines, um, uh, sanitizing all of the surfaces. Uh, we were working on getting folks um, stepped up to have a routine after we came back from spring break and making sure that all surfaces were cleaned and sanitized daily, um, all high contact spots, etc. And so this is not a, a new response, but what I'm going to take you from is when, uh, as I've, I've joked many times and they're tired of it, but as I was sitting underneath a bush trimming in my front yard and got three different phone calls because everybody knows I don't pay attention, uh, that the governor had closed our schools for two weeks. And so that started a week ago on Sunday and this entire team has hit the pavement running and we have been really throughout the last uh, week or so. So I do want to share, I'm turned on. So as you are aware, we have new carpeting, so everything was destroyed while you were gone, and uh, we're still working on getting everything up and running. And so actually, um, what I want to start with is House Bill 2910 um, and Senate Bill 1693. And these were actually approved by the legislature yesterday. As far as I know, I haven't received any update as of this afternoon. They have not yet been signed by the governor. And so um, this is the legislation that we will now be working under. And I'm stalling a little bit because Mrs. Fleming was going to pull that up for me with um, – some highlights that I could share with the board. Thank you. 
think if you would scroll down to the first page. There we go. That's good. Thank you. And so at the beginning of the bill, um, the actual information was for if a closure went through March 29th, I believe, which was the original two-week closure. And so that was written into the bill as it went through the House and the Senate. Um, however, during that time, the closure was extended. So now we actually go down to Section C of the bill, which is where this begins. And essentially what this bill says, and I've tried to highlight some of the key points, uh, it reads that if the um, school closure announced on March 15th is extended beyond March 29th, then the following applies. And so the first one is that public schools are not required to extend the number of school days or add school days for that closure that occurred during the first two weeks. So that takes care of that. Um, because we were not offering and were not required to provide general educational opportunities. However, number two talks about beginning March 30th, each public school shall offer students general educational opportunities for the duration of the statewide closure in order for us to receive continued funding. And so this is a requirement in the law. And again, um, we were anticipating that this would be a requirement within the law. And so we are going to have to provide what are defined as general educational opportunities for students for the entire time that we are closed. The highlight in blue basically reads that the Board of Education and the Department of Education shall determine the manner in which a public school attests that it is complying with this paragraph. And so we do not currently have any direction on how we are going to show that we're providing educational opportunities, how we need to actually document that information. Um, we have plans in place, obviously, but we haven't really uh, gotten any guidance on that. Uh, most of you received the, a the ASBA updates, and so if you read the update that included a summary of this bill, the um, suggestion was that the State Board may be meeting as early as tomorrow. They did have a meeting on Monday, which was canceled. And so uh, if they meet, we assume that they will be able to develop guidelines, perhaps in a meeting, and that we might have information by as early as Friday. Uh, we may not have information as early as Friday. So uh, we're going to move forward with our plan and then anticipate um, what we need to do as, a, as, a, as we get updated. And so then on the second page there, under number three, it talks about the fact that if it's not lifted for the entire school year, I'm sorry, if, it is, if it's not lifted, that we have to continue offering these opportunities until the regular calendar end of our school year would occur. But then the next little section under number four there is if it is lifted, and this is an interesting statement because if it is lifted, our district board would have the opportunity to determine whether or not you want to resume physical operation or continue offering those educational opportunities uh, externally until the end of the calendar year. And so um, depends on what happens from the state, but there is the potential that it could be lifted at the state level and then districts be given the option of whether or not to resume or not. And so, of course, if that occurs, we would ask immediately to convene the board and have that discussion. And I want you to be aware of it because I think it might be something to be thinking about. You know, in the event, where are we from two weeks from now, which is when the earliest that it would be lifted. Item number five just really addresses funding that because we cannot currently transport our students because they're not in school, we will not lose our transportation funding. So our transportation funding will be based on 1819. Um, but the last paragraph, which was an important piece for us, is that the transportation fleet, including buses, may be used to perform school operations that are deemed to support students and their families during the statewide closure as determined by the school district. And so we actually can be using our drivers and our buses to do some other things. And I'll share a little bit more about some thoughts with that. So on um, number six, and then uh, A and B underneath that, I want to share some language that I'm concerned about and we have not received clarification on yet. What the language reads under number six is that for the benefit of students enrolled in public schools, that each public school in the state shall continue to pay, pay all of its employees, including hourly employees, for the duration of the closure. And so before March 30th, 
which is still this week. Um, school employees, including hourly employees, they need to commit to be available and work their normal hours. However, if, it, if they're able to perform their task remotely, they shall be allowed to work remotely. So there is a shall in the legislation. When it talks about the item C, the public employee is unable to perform their work tasks remotely, then the public school shall reassign the employee to other tasks that the employee is able to perform remotely. And the employee shall perform those tasks beginning March 30th. And so as I read this, and I'm, the literal interpretation reading it would be that we won't have employees working after March 30th because it says they shall be allowed to rem work remotely. That is contrary to the direction that ADE had given us previous to this legislation being signed. And uh, directly from the state superintendent and the governor had said that we could have employees at the school sites. We could even um, work with small groups of students if we chose to do so. So it'll be interesting to see in terms of when the governor signs it, what kind of guidance we get on this. Much of the work that we need to do in order to provide educational services to students will require us to come into the office or into the classroom on occasion, if not, certainly not daily. All right, and then under number seven, in the meantime, we have to ensure that each of our students who has a Section 504 or an IEP plan um, have the opportunity to have access to their um, accommodations and modifications, so those opportunities that are available for them. And then finally, on the third pages of the bill, they have canceled our statewide assessment. So that was, that was done um, because we will not be back in time to conduct that. They have made the determination that our letter grade will be the same as it was in 2018-19. So for our schools, whatever their letter grade was, they won't be um, affected by the fact that we're not doing testing this year. Um, and then they also have suspended the requirement to use the state test for third grade promotion. So that's referred to the move on when reading. Uh, it doesn't mean that students would not be retained if they're not reading, but it doesn't have to be based on the same, on that assessment. So um, the number 12 that's highlighted in green right at the top of the screen now, it does talk about the State Board of Education shall adopt rules for the graduation of public school students from high school for 1920. And that's one of the things we're waiting on guidance for, because for our students to be able to graduate, they will have had to complete their course of study. And so part of our discussion has been about prioritizing our seniors in their ability to finish their courses, and so that they can, in fact, graduate with their diploma. There are a lot of questions that are still out there, and we'll talk a little more about those. And then finally, on um, number 14D, they are applying for every waiver that they can from the feds. And our understanding, and Dr. Stone was helpful in this, that um, Betsy DeVos has suspended the federal requirement for testing and has been approving any state that's requesting a waiver from testing. And so we are anticipating that that will not be a problem for our school districts. Interestingly, the state has not suspended any of our due dates for our title plans um, for those kinds of things. So those are all. You don't have to put your taxes in, but we need to get our, our district uh, LEA plan in. So, um, and then there's a, also a sentence there that I think is um, pretty open about any school finance requirements in order to implement this, that those might be waived. So that's the essence of the bill. It's an emergency bill. And again, uh, we're anticipating that the governor should sign that any day. So, any questions on that? No, but on the section that you were concerned about where it says that an employee sh shall, I don't remember the number, was that number six, that uh, an employee shall, um, um, yes, I would think that, that the interpretation, the reason it's written that way, you have vulnerable employees who have health issues and you have classified people who normally you would think they can only work at the school, but they could be vulnerable too with, with their health and they could live with people who are vulnerable. And now they can do their work out of their home and classified people can use 
there's phones to contact parents and, do, and, and all kinds of And we of will things. go into that. Yeah, no okay. question. So the concern you. that we have is, for example, if we were to use our buses to deliver work out to remote sections mm -hmm. of the district, if we aren't allowed to have an employee drive the bus to do that, how do we then meet those educational needs mm -hmm. for students? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're, um, the kind of work that you cannot do from home if we have to find other work for those folks, if that's a necessary component of running our district, so we still have to have payroll, we still have to do some of those things people have to come in and out in order to be able to do. Okay. In, in one section, you talk about how the ADE and the um, State Board has not yet provided guidance on how to document the provision of educational materials. Um, do you anticipate that they will have, uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's not a fair question because if we don't have guidance on this, maybe you wouldn't have guidance on this on the other thing as well. But do you have any anticipation that they will have requirements regarding what happens on the student and parent end of this? No, I, I, we don't have. Um, so we've been doing a lot of talking. So if you don't mind holding that thought, I, will, I get into some of the things we've been talking about now since we've been discussing this. Because we've had the, this bill language um, generally for uh, about a week because the Senate bill was introduced first. Like they're working yet? No? Okay. okay. Next one. All right. And so what are, um, what are we currently doing? At this point in time, we are distributing meals to all children 18 and under. And uh, we have added, so this is not the most current version that I sent, oh well. Um, we have added a site, which is the New Hope Calvary Church in Desert Hills, for our fourth site for meal distribution because the Desert Hills uh, community was, it's pretty isolated and that provides a spot for them. And so Anne is uh, opening that site as of tomorrow? Yes. Today? Okay, so it was open today. Uh, our recommendation right now, and I did tell the principals this, is to cancel all student travel through June. And uh, that gives them plenty of time to uh, cancel any of the um, trips that they have most of the organizations are now offering vouchers for students who wouldn't be able to complete travel, travel that's rescheduled or allowing them to reschedule the travel for a later date. Uh, again, canceling all staff travel through May. And then uh, we have developed, thank you, uh, Mrs. Festa-Dagel for this work and looked at some other districts, a temporary work from home agreement that um, basically describes what's the expectation for you if you are working from home as far as your hours go and talk about the kinds of things that, um, that need to be handled. In our conversations with our principals and staff have already begun these conversations, the kinds of things like Mrs. Cox mentioned about making phone calls to parents, we're talking about teachers having office hours, um, having schedules for making phone calls, having the opportunity to do some planning and so forth. So there's a lot of things that they can be doing from home. And again, if any of uh, you all want to pipe in on some of this, feel free to do so. And then the other thing that we spent some time doing is defining what general educational opportunities are for our district. So I if you would go to the next slide. What we wanted to talk with teachers about and, and think about was not overwhelming our families because they're, to send things home that students can't do is not going to be productive. Um, to send so much work home that's busy work is not going to be productive. And so what we talked about and came to consensus on is we want the work that's going to be sent home, because we're talking general educational opportunities. This is an opportunity for students to continue to learn and to enrich themselves while they're at home. It's not the requirement that you have to do these four things in order to pass your class. And so these need to be quality opportunities. They need to be quality, not quantity and um, opportunities to enhance their learning, which could be review, it could be practice, it could be some new things that are, um, that are accessible for students independently. Um, and then focus on what the big ideas are for your content area. What are those essential things that kids need to learn? All of the things have big ideas. And so, for example, we were just talking about at the elementary level on the Singapore math, there's a really nice chart that talks about in kindergarten, these are the big things you learn in kindergarten. And so if we were to focus the, the work that's being sent home for mathematics around those big ideas, it may not be exactly what would be taught in the classroom in a Singapore math lesson, but the conceptual pieces that we need kids to understand, they would have the opportunity to focus on those. And we don't want our students to get that far behind this year. 
The other uh, concept that we talked about is whatever we send home, send home needs to be accessible to all students. And so that means whether it's virtually or by paper, but also it means that um, regardless of reading level or those kinds of other um, possible deficiencies that they have access points into that learning. And I mentioned already um, engaging resources and materials, not busy work. And then finally, uh, really spending time encouraging reading and writing. Those are some things that they can do at home that will enhance their skills just by practice. Mr. Carden, do you want to add anything to that? May I ask something? Um, I think it was on Facebook, a, a parent wrote in and said that she homeschools her, her own children. And she said, parents, this is not going to be something where your child's going to be up in the morning at 8 and working until 3. She, you, the homeschool kids don't need that because they're not all the different levels of, of, of ability in a classroom that a teacher has to contend with. And she suggested something. I'm just asking: Is this kind of what what you're what you're thinking of, like a maybe a kindergarten or first grade or second grader, no more than one to two hours of schoolwork a day, and then you, you move on up, maybe in high school it's three to four hours or something. I mean, I, I'm just I, I don't know if you've got the homeschool model in your mind, but I want I want parents to uh, they're thinking of parents. I think are thinking about time. Oh my gosh. You know, I've, I've got to get out. We're going to work. I don't even know how to do this. I don't understand this equation. What am I going to do? And I, I just don't, that's, you know, what does that look like to them time-wise, do you think? I agree. That was well said, and I agree with what was said. Thank you. I, I, I would like to dovetail into that because I, I'm a parent, and I've got three in the district. Um, we got the call today. from I took the call from the high school on my cell phone, and uh, uh, the first question was, do you have computers available for your children? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she liked my answer when I said thousands. <laughs> uh, and then the second question was, do you have Internet service at home? But as, as a parent, um, I've, got, I've got two IEPs in my family, and one of the IEPs is an extended time IEP, and I think this is going to look a lot more like that uh, to a parent. Um, I think what we're going to find is we're going to find we're not going to get a packet of work every day. We're going to get assignments, and we're going to have a week on the assignments, and you're allowed to work through them at your leisure. Um, and, and, you know, it's going to be an hour here, an hour there. I jokingly told my wife that the classroom is going to be next to my office, not hers. <laughs> um, 
at, at, at our office downtown. But it, in, in reality, this is going to be a real easy touch, I think, from what I've heard in, in that interview. Um, parents are being given options. Do you want the, the curriculum delivered electronically? Do you want to pack it? Can you come get it? Do we need to bring it to you? There's a lot of flexibility in this, and and if I were if I were to tell parents out there anything, it's deep breath. It's not that big of a deal. This is going to be like homework in a very basic way. It's true. It's truly it's an educational opportunity so that students don't lose the things that they've already learned throughout this year. And I think Mr. Gardner and he said it very well. We had a um, a meeting with all of our administrative team this morning via Zoom and. Everybody's very anxious about doing the right thing and what are the rules. And we have teachers who have planned PowerPoints and, you know, all kinds of stuff so that essentially kids were going to get what they had in class. And there, there's, regardless of where we stand and how serious we think this is, there's a lot of anxiety out there right now. And um, we don't want to add to their anxiety. We just want to make sure there are some things for kids to do that will keep them learning and keep them engaged and uh, Keep them on track, really. We know they're not going to learn everything that they were supposed to learn in the fourth quarter. The, the blessing in this is that it is the fourth quarter, and we would have already spent another two to three weeks in testing anyway. And so, um, you know, that's, you know, if there are blessings, I think that's one of them. So. Yeah. And I think, you, I think you did do a good job of communicating that to the teachers because as on the parent end of things, I've spoken or been emailed by almost all of my kids' teachers, and all of them said ex kind of what you've been saying is that, um, first of all, they, they made sure that the kids know that they're missed and, and cared about and everything, um, and it just was very much a sort of laissez-faire type of approach where we're going to have some, there are going to be assignments due, but it, it did not feel like a high-pressure situation at all. So I think you, I would just want to commend the administration because I think you did a good job of communicating that to the teachers. Thank you. You need to look at this team here. So. so just to make light of it, it's easier than getting a roll of toilet paper today. <laughs> um, not to preempt anything, but were you going to tell us uh, what you're doing for the children who don't have uh, computers or an internet and or internet? Yeah. 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 So, go ahead. Thank you. And if this doesn't uh, run very long, then what you're saying makes sense. But if, I mean, it makes sense anyway. But if it really runs long, this will be true of everyone in the country. So all the children will have the same situation. And just to bring this up, uh, I, I'm, I brought that up because, as many of you know, I am on a local task force trying to help out just with the COVID-19 crisis. And we have done masks for almost everyone, N95s for people in, on the front line, and also other masks for anyone who wants it. They're still available. We've done uh, purchasing some hazmat-type suits or some protective gear, more PPE. &E. And we've started testing at um, remote locations with mobile uh, testing rather than face-to-face. And um, I can't think of anything else, but we are more than willing to get funds, to raise funds to get computers and or internet for kids and also ask people for 
um, computer uh, laptops or something they may want to donate, and so I would need specs if if we are looking for that sort of thing. Just putting that in. Okay. Thank so you. if you can tell me today, that would be great. And at, at this point in time, we've talked about um, not checking out computers to students. Um, What's been interesting in this process is we've actually, through these phone calls, we have some parents who don't want their students to get their, uh, be out on the internet and doing their work and are asking for packets. And so um, we're, we're essentially working with what is it that's comfortable for you now, uh, which will, I think, be okay taking us through May, um, which is the longest that it would last would be through May. And then we do have we do have student computers at a lot of our elementary sites if we got to the point where we needed to check them out. But our priority right now is the high school seniors, and uh, making sure that they get their credits in, and then moving down from that. Because if a student's failing a class and they aren't going to be able to get credit, if we well, let me go on to the to the next slide. Uh, here, can I can I just interject real sure. quick? Um, sorry to interrupt you, but um, just so that everybody knows out there, especially those out online. Uh, uh, I just did a real quick look. At least Suddenlink is offering free Internet uh, for at least the next two months. Uh, I'm not sure what Frontier and Wire Free are doing in our community, but there is free Internet out there if you need it. And as far as the computer capability, it literally, for most of what we do, it's got to have some type of a basic word processor on it, which uh, both Apple's and, and Windows PCs come with. And... Uh, Internet access capabilities. It doesn't need to be much of a computer at all. Uh, in fact, with our with our system, if if push came to shove, uh, a very basic Chromebook uh, would would take care of those needs. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> getting into the action. So we actually did spend a lot of time talking about access and opportunity, um, and with families' comfort level and students' comfort level and so forth. And so the task that we gave the the principals and the staff was that uh, we wanted to look at schools and grade level subject matter teams, and they're doing this via Zoom, developing lessons for students that they could complete at home, and having them be substantially the same across. So if you're in third grade, regardless of which elementary school, the, the third grade um, assignment that's sent home is identical or very, very similar. Uh, same thing if you're in the um, world history. Across all of the world history teachers, the assignment would be very similar. And so, um, if not identical. Now, what we've talked about to this point, because of the type of work that it is and the fact that not every family, when we talk about access and opportunity, it also means access and opportunity to get the work and to complete the work, not just to, to get on the Internet and, and do it, et cetera. And so what we've talked about right now is that at K-8, the work that we're giving is going to be basically these are educational opportunities for you at home um, to you for you to keep enriching your education while you are not able to come to school. But we are not going to collect those for credit and grading at this point. For 912, we not we haven't made that choice yet because we do know that for students they're in courses that require credit, and if they are unable to get the credit, then they're going to have to make up classes. And so as we're talking about that, um, we've, we've talked a little bit about wherever we were at the end of the third quarter, that that would be the student's grade. And then if a student is failing, and we've actually already had our uh, middle and high school people start to do this, um, they are contacting those students individually to allow them those opportunities to, to not fail. So they could actually do the work, turn it in, do some additional things to bring their grade up to a passing grade. And particularly at the high school, they would be able to get credit. Um, as Mr. Gardner alluded to, we also have students that are in honors and AP classes that are trying to improve their grade uh, as they're getting ready to be qualified to go to college. And so um, we're working on and talking about what would be a plan for that. But at this moment in time, depending on what guidance we get, our plan is to look for grading as where we were at the end of third quarter with opportunities to improve but not to climb. And then our, our, did you have a question? Yeah, okay. Um, we determined that our distribution date will be Mondays, and so Mr. Mazin was correct. We're looking at weekly, and depending on how long it goes, it might be you get a two, two weeks' worth of assignments, and that um, Mondays would be generally your distribution. We haven't totally finalized the times for that because we do have parents that have kids at different schools, 
and even different elementary schools. And so we don't want to say for the whole district it's at 9 o'clock and you're running around, you know, trying to get work. So, um, so if you want to pick work up, the school sites will have hours that the work can be picked up. And then we also are going to offer it for those who want to do it, and they're being asked, as you know, um, make it available electronically. And then the third thing would be maybe using our buses as a resource. So we talked about, for example, Thunderbolt, because the students who don't live right by Thunderbolt all get buses. So one of the ideas would be that um, a seventh grade uh, uh, work assignment so that covers the four core areas and then an eighth grade work assignment that covers the four core areas could be available out at all of the bus stops. So the drivers could go to the bus stops and have bins of work that could become and picked up by students. So those are the ideas we're floating around right now. We haven't finalized those yet, and principals are talking with staff. We were hoping to get more guidance than we've gotten so far from um, ADE. And uh, so what we're doing as a team is we're meeting at 1 o'clock on Wednesday. We're meeting at 1 o'clock again on Thursday. And we will continue to meet daily until we have answers to all of our questions. I will be using my discretion as a parent to not let my 6th and 8th graders know that their work isn't going to be graded. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, we do have, uh, this has been really interesting. Some of, our, some of our teachers are getting very creative about how they can do some things. And so some of them are making teacher videos and um, doing other things. And so those we will post to the website. And Jenny, would you mind sharing a couple of the examples that... that uh, you heard about? And we actually had a couple of so. it's red. No. We had a couple of teachers doing story time today um, on their school Facebook pages, um, but we're going to ask for teachers to post to the uh, to the district YouTube and we're going to organize it by grade level. And so that way, if you're in first grade, no matter what site you're at, you can look at some first grade videos. Um, we're also going to just try to do some fun things uh, this week before we get really organized, but we've got a PE teacher that's going to do a Facebook Live. But we'll start to really try to put those things um, into the school district's YouTube, and then we'll post that um, up to the, the website, so that way parents can access those and they can play it um, across sites anytime. Other thoughts have been like an art lesson there. The kids can do it at home, but the teachers teaching it on a video. There's been ideas about music lessons. Um, science teachers have had some thoughts about things. And so people are getting creative with how to have it engaging things for kids to do at home. Again, that, that particular strategy requires access to YouTube. Um, but that is one of the things that will be out there. Um, uh, as Mr. Mazin gave the example of, all of our schools are contacting parents right now. And so how they're doing that is depending on they're doing it in different ways. But in most cases, they are making phone calls as well. And uh, they are talking about how you would like to receive your schoolwork opportunities, but also just checking in in general and seeing how you're doing. Um, it was interesting that and I know there are several of us were at school sites on Monday when we started our food distribution. I happened to be at Thunderbolt, and they had signs out, um, you know, for the kids in the cars as they went by. But what was fun about it was that as they were coming by, the, um, there was uh, counselors and um, the principal and assistant principal and a couple of teachers were out there, and they recognized kids and, hi, I miss you, how are you doing, you know, that kind of stuff. It was just really, it was like a... Uh, very exciting for them to drive up and get their food, and um, it, was, it was fun to watch. So we, we're seeing that attitude among our staff. They really are uh, trying to do what's best for kids and engaging them. I, I need to interject something. This is a sign. Yes. In the email that we got from the district mm -hmm. that went out to all parents, it said that it, it told them about the link to this meeting, and so we are live. Mm -hmm. But the next paragraph says questions and comments may be emailed to the board meeting. Is someone here watching the email? Yes. 
You are. Oh, and, when, and when we're finished, um, those those have to be read into the record. Oh, good. Okay. And so those will all be read into the record. And an opportunity, if we can answer them, we will. And if not, we certainly will be doing research on them. Well, I should have known you would have thought of everything. But I've been to meetings before where we promised somebody we were going to do something, and we forgot about it. So good for you. We did have, actually, it wasn't live as soon as the blackboard went out and people were already checking it. But it, all right. I take it back. That's okay. I should have mentioned up front that we were that we were doing that. I apologize. And then um, we have been developing and working with plans for um, our staff who are at risk, and that has been a big part of this. Uh, we do have a couple of recommendations in this area with the board, and um, because we cannot, we didn't have time to do anything for this particular meeting. But there's a couple of areas that we're focusing on. One of them is that in our um, regulation. We have uh, our staff that haven't passed probation, our classified staff, they have to wait 90 days before they can even use any of their accrued sick leave. And so one of the things that we would like to do is to waive this waiting period for new staff this year only, so that if they have, if they are high risk, they can use their sick leave if they need to. Um, if they're not able to work from home, then, um, or if they don't want to do any work, because we, we do have some people who don't want to do work while they're not well and uh, they need to take sick time anyway. And so um, they, they could actually use their earned sick time right away instead of having to wait 90 days. And then the other area that we're looking at is on the sick leave bank. What we would like to do for this year, and we'll bring it back to the board as a policy, hopefully retroactive, but wanted to give you a heads up that this is where we're, where we're planning to do, is um, allow people to donate more sick leave to the sick leave bank. Um, so right now, if you have 30 days of sick leave, you can donate five, I think it is. So we want to wrap that to 10. And then if you have 20 days, um, that if you have 60 days, you can donate 20 days. And then if you have 90 days, that you can donate 30 days. So we can build up the sick leave bank. And then we do have, we have quite a few staff members that are, that are facing some very serious illnesses. And a lot who have been on chemotherapy or those kinds of things where they really are at risk. And because of that, they've used up much of their sick leave. And so um, what we want to do is to add in um, that the superintendent or superintendent's designee can grant an exception to go beyond the use of 100 days for the, from the sick leave bank, adding to that. So, um, so those are the three areas that we want to work with for our, for our staff who are at risk. And um, yeah. Superintendent Sire. Yes. Um, where is the district in regards to the recently passed legislation on additional paid time off? Uh, the, the, the federal government um, added 80 hours of paid time off, and uh, uh, the thought process behind that is that you can use your FICA tax filings uh, against that. Yeah. I, don't I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Government. So we haven't gotten clear direction as schools. I've seen um, a couple of publications, Education Week, talk about the direction for schools, but there has been no clear direction of how it will apply to us. Um, I know it doesn't start. There's a window. like It starts in April. Um, so for right now, until we have a little bit more clear direction, this is our band-aid until we get there. But I have seen nothing. Um, from any education HR organization that has said, this is where you're going, which is very strange, and I look daily. Um, but that is something that the personnel department is very well aware of, and we are looking constantly, um, thinking about what that is going to be and how that will change all of this. But this is our intermediate, knowing that legislation can change every second. Like I say to everyone, it's very fluid. This is what we're doing now to support staff now. I'd also like to um, suggest maybe, I know that we've done a lot of donating sick time. I've seen it repeatedly since I've been on the board. But maybe borrowing against your own sick time might be a good idea. I know the county is doing that now. And that way, because what I don't want to find ourselves in a situation where people have donated their sick time and then all of a sudden they need sick time because we don't know where this is going. So it might be a better idea just to borrow against your own sick time for this short period. You mean like your future sick time? Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, and, and so in 
Superintendent Asire came to me, she, she actually said, well, I'd be happy to give all of mine. And we have other people that this is their last year, they're retiring. And so I did not, when I thought, I was like, that's fine. But then I thought, well, what if people get sick? So I did not say, you can donate as much as you want, because I thought, oh, well, then we're just back at square one. So I doubled it, um, but I have those same concerns, even with the people with 30 giving 10. Um, and so those are things to think about because we do want to protect everyone thinking if they need to use their sick time as well. Could you, is there any way to make a very fluid policy in, in regards to that? Where you could, you could be in either fluid. or in the end? I would take a, a look at the county. I think they just did it. So. If you put it into policy, it's no longer fluid. Right, we would do a temporary, just similar to legislation. This is a temporary, and this expires on, you know, June 30th or whatever. Then you can renew it, yeah. yeah. Well, since there's a pause, I would like to thank the directors, Mrs. Asire, um, I'm sure Mrs. Fleming, and I mean, you guys have really gotten ahead of all of this, I and mean, even to planning the school board meeting so we can model social distancing. I mean, that, 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 that it's like you, you thought of the whole thing, and, uh, and you gave up your spring break to do that, and also to thank the t teachers and the staff who came in on Monday and did their work and are off and running. And, and uh, you know, it's just a remarkable thing. Thank sure. you. I've, I've been very impressed by everyone, and the principals have all said, you know, people were were positive and, and you know, were creative and thinking about ways that they can do and make this work. It's been very, very um, heartwarming, I guess. I would say heartwarming would be a good word. And so you all know, Aggie's the one that's been in charge of this. And so even back from the beginning, she's had to sit through all the original webinars. Now we're pretty much all doing it together because it's blossomed. But um, the, as far as the, the point person for all of the information, and she's been you know, making sure we all get that. But everybody has stepped in. And uh, we did have some fun with Mike because he was in Florida when all this happened. Uh, and so he had to zoom in from the beach in Florida, and so every once in a while he'd just turn his little screen and have us all look at the beach while we were sitting there in our <laughs> offices zooming. So, but he did make it back, which was what we were worried about. So we have unknowns, and we probably have more unknowns than this, but these are the ones that we could think of today. Uh, we, we really don't know about um, the student grading, and particularly for the high school. So we are talking about using third quarter. We are waiting for some advisement. Uh, we don't know what those ADE and SBE advisories are going to be in terms of the ex educational opportunities. I think things that we're doing now are, are going to be fine, but you know, who knows. Uh, we're assuming that they have good sense and they recognize that the position that schools are in in, in um, getting this out because I don't believe there's going to be a way to document that every child has picked up a packet or has been given one. You know, they're just, that's not going to be possible. Um, I think for, for me, the two biggies is there are going to be long-term educational effects to this. And so we already know, um, I forget the name of it, the summer, summer uh, when you drop, when you lose your learning over the summer. There's a name for it. Brain drain? Yeah, that's what we call it. Yeah. I, I can't. Summer slide. Is that it? Summer slide? Yeah. Something like that? Anyway, there's, a, there's like an educational term for it. Um, so by virtue of the fact that students are going to be out of school from essentially spring break, and we don't know for sure how long, uh, there will be some, some slide, and some of those particularly who don't take advantage of the opportunities, or for those who were already not passing their classes or weren't doing that well. And so I do think that one of the things we need to think about once we move into, as Aggie calls the recovery mode from all of this, is what are we going to do about possibly having some special opportunities during the summer? Um, are there some considerations for next year that the board may want to think about for certain students that we offer maybe some Saturday opportunities for school, that maybe we do some um, additional tutoring, uh, look at a variety of ways that we can help kids get caught up because for certain populations this is going to have a negative impact on them. And then the other area is the long-term fiscal impact. And, I, you know, Mike and I have been talking a little bit about this, but 
with everything that's happening and, and so many people in communities across the state that are that are not able to work and they're not getting paid, that is going to impact our economy as a state. It's certainly going to impact taxes. People aren't buying. You know, there's all of those things. And so we've, we have a projected budget based on our student ADM. Um, we're going to be having a webinar tomorrow to see what the, the final recommended skinny budget that the state is um, hopefully going to adopt some sort of a budget here shortly. Uh, but we'll get an idea about that in terms of our income. Um, but, but I was even thinking about, so we, we're relying right now on our income from our override on taxes that are paid. And so because people, you know, we may not be getting all the taxes in that we normally get in. Those kinds of numbers might be impacted. So unknown what the long-term fiscal impact will be, but I do think that that's something to pay attention to, that uh, we are going to have an impact from this. As, just as a state and as a community. So, and I'm open to any other unknowns that you want to throw out there. Do you have more slides to go through? Or is uh, that is, I believe that's my last slide. Yes, that's it. So I don't, open for board questions, comments, and then we can also go to the, to the audience. Okay. If you have something. I just have a couple of comments mm -hmm. um, in terms of the actual work being done. Um, I know a few people that homeschool, and one of the things that they're doing right now, just because of the time and how unprecedented this situation is, is they're having their kids journal. And I think that's a great opportunity to have our kids practice writing, because I don't know how much practice they're getting, but it's one of our you know, biggest downfalls in education is actually writing. So especially if we're not grading it, because then the pressure is off, you know, in terms of, what it looks like, but just to be doing it on a regular basis. Um, the other thing is, um, I'm wondering if uh, there isn't an opportunity uh, within the school district, within the teachers, within the high school students, middle school students, sixth graders, to make flashcards. You know what I'm saying? For the younger kids as a way to practice those math facts. I don't know that every, you know, kindergarten through fifth grader has a set of flashcards. Maybe they do, maybe they don't, but um, but I do know that I appreciate the fact that you guys are on the simple path because the parents are freaked out, although they shouldn't be. And I just want any parent out there to know that, you know, it's it's not rocket science. You know, every parent can, can help their child in this time without stressing about, am I doing something wrong? Um, just... Like John said, take a deep breath and it'll be fine. But I think writing is a really good idea. And then the last thing, um, uh, comment or suggestion, uh, would be for the high schoolers. Have we looked at the Hillsdale College uh, courses? Everything is free. They, you get a printed certificate. They have a zillion uh, from economics to the Constitution. I mean, they have some phenomenal courses. Um, and that this is a really good time for us to be paying attention to all those important founding documents, et cetera, um, because our civil liberties are, are in question right now, and there's a lot to think about in the economic side of it and, you know, the balance of what's best for the community. So all those questions are being discussed right now, so it's really relevant to their lives and their futures. And I think if I may comment just on the no grading, one of the things that would be really good about this, and if we can get engaging things, is rebuilding that intrinsic love of learning. And yes. not, you're not doing it for that extrinsic grade or right. whatever that is. And, for and understanding. Here's our hope for this next few weeks. Yeah. That's what our students experience. Just because you mentioned practical ideas, and I love the journaling one because um, I did see advice online as well. Um, that our kids will remember this time, absolutely. It's going to be um, hopefully not traumatic, but very impactful. Uh, think about the first news story that you remember as a kid experiencing. For me, it's the Challenger explosion. So this is something that they'll remember, and then keeping track of their thoughts is um, going to be very valuable for them. But I think that they will ha appreciate having a record to look back on someday. Um, and then for other practical ideas, one of the things I saw was even just cooking it with your kids, like including them in a meal, teaches them a lot of skills. Um, board games, it doesn't necessarily have to be a quote-unquote educational board game. They can learn different strategic skills and how to plan ahead through 
just the most basic of board games. Um, and I only include that because you brought up the journal, and I thought that was a great, great thing to mention. Backgammon's a great board <laughs> game. Um, I did. I don't think this particular parent email went through because he said that he tried to email it and it bounced back. I think I have it. I think it's been forwarded. Okay. Okay. Um, the one that he was concerned about the different platforms. Yeah. Okay. So if you had a set time that you were going to read those through, then I'll just not bring it up right now. Yeah. Any other sort of general comments? I. The first thing I want to do is I want to thank uh, Superintendent Asai and the entire staff. I mean, this I've, I've had a couple of staff members interact with me uh, about how come this isn't done yet, why isn't this quicker. Um, we have people who are ultra-prepared and we have people who aren't so ultra-prepared, and that's pretty normal in a staff. But when you, look at the, when you look at the task, and the task was how do we take everything we do every day <laughs> and make it external, accessible, and Very easy fair. enough that a parent can do it. And, and not minimizing parents in any way. It's just uh, I've got a brother and a sister both with dual master's degrees uh, in education. And, and knowing what they do versus what I do as a parent, it, it's a much different animal. So how do, we, how do we export all of that to a parent to be at a point where we can platform and maybe flip the switch on one day um, is, is huge. Um, the other thing for our community out there, this is fast moving, things are changing almost minute by minute, um, not only in what we're doing in here, but in an understanding of what's going on in the rest of the world. So if you bear with us a little bit, your, your kids will be fine, you will be fine, and we'll all, we'll all, again, take that deep breath and we'll just get this handled. So, but again, thank you to the, to, uh, the staff at Lake Avis Unified and, and Superintendent Messiah for her leadership. I appreciate that. I think everybody does. Um, this appreciate also those people who sent those emails in earlier, so we were able to start looking at some answers. And for the one with all the multiple platforms, just mm -hmm. so you know, that's on our agenda for our 1 o'clock meeting tomorrow. Okay. He will be reassured to hear that, I think. <laughs> okay, from here. So just to share... Um, there is Facebook Live issues going on, so um, I don't I don't know that we're getting all of the questions. So I don't know if Drake can still send the email address out if people have questions. Um, but so there's just a couple of a few comments. So uh, the first one is uh, please make things easier on everyone and just start summer break early, like now. And after all this is over, then the kids can go back to school as normal. The next is a question. So this is from DP. Um, some of them don't have full names. It was. It had their full name. Okay. I, I think we should stick to what we said. If we said okay. we wanted full names, then Perfect. and if they don't have that, then we can just okay. skip over it. The next is from Jeremy Peterson. With the mandated school closures, how will this affect the ending date of the 2019-20 school year? Will it remain the same as originally set in the beginning of the year? And so that that was answer through legislation that the ending date will be the ending date. The next question is from Stephanie Luares. What has been the response to the breakfast lunch distribution at the several sites uh, that have been opened? If that number starts to dwindle, will those sites remain open? If at some point it is determined to be unnecessary to continue due to number, what will be the options for the children that are usual, utilizing that service to still obtain food? I believe day one the numbers were about 500 who who came and, and, and took a breakfast and lunch item from each of the three sites. I, I, I believe that if numbers start to dwindle, 
that will not affect the three sites. What would probably happen is it would take the conversation of um, and discussion of expanding to other sites off the table, but I don't foresee us um, reducing sites at this point. I think that even if children or, or several children are coming up to utilize that, that particular service that we're going to continue uh, as long as, as the schools remain closed. Is, is there any system for knowing who is coming, which students are picking up meals and which are not, and so that maybe people can make phone calls and ask parents, do they anticipate needing this in the future? Is there a system that has been developed? The only because because of the grant and because or well, because of the program itself, all that's required is that there are right. individuals who show up, and we just keep count of as to how many meals are sent out. Right, but I'm just saying we could possibly could make it even more available if we had some system to keep track, and we, we're going to need jobs for aides to do, and they can call the parents and. I, I think that the email that we got indicated no questions asked. It's for every child in our city. Oh, no. That's and under. right. But just so then you can't collect. They are. A follow up to, to make sure parents who are not showing up actually know about it and how Correct. it works or something. We're, like we're that. taking every opportunity when we have communication that goes out that we're including that as a reminder that okay. these, these sites are up and running and distributing food. Okay. And so, Kathy, that, so yesterday when we started calling, um, that was part of the questions asked. We let people know. Um, from my understanding, um, at some of the schools, teachers then made calls again today to remind parents um, about meals. And so they're continuing to call. So this was, I think, the, the question that everyone received. Uh, will the digital platform for online school be the same for all grades? This is very important. So far, I've received several emails from my children's teachers, each talking about a different platform for online work. This is crazy. How can we keep up gathering work from different spots? So far, my kids, one preschool, two elementary, one middle school, we've heard from five or six people. This is from Tim Giles. Um, and we will be addressing this tomorrow. Uh, we definitely have asked multiple times, less is more. Please only stick to what we've used before. Um, please do not add other platforms. So there are some online platforms, whether it's Class Dojo um, that's used in elementary school and maybe Google Classroom that they're already using. Um, and so we really are continuing to ask to not add new things for students to use. And I think I, uh, I did respond to this email, um, but I, I definitely see his point of view because we're kind of in a similar vote, but I also see the teacher's point of view where if they already have a platform that they've rolled out since the beginning of the school year, they are probably reluctant to change midstream, and so I, I can understand from their point of view as well. We don't, we don't want teachers to have to learn something new or students to, to learn something new, so we're really trying to keep it simple. Uh, the one thing that we're doing that is new is, is Zoom because we're not able to have meetings between all of us. And so I do know that there are some teachers that that is one of the ways that they're communi communicating with kids. And so, um, but we're definitely trying to keep it as simple as possible, whether it is paper, pencil, phone calls, um, but things that are already in the hands of students. So are we saying that we have kindergarten, first, second graders that are already using digital platforms? It's how they communicate with the parents. <clears throat> okay, so we're not going to move our first graders to a digital platform for schoolwork. That will be delivered, paper it's copies. For the parents, it's for the parents. Okay. 
or, the, or the parent. Okay. Okay. Yeah, those are parent communication tools versus digital platforms with students, but it's how, but they're called different things. So, um, but, but those are parent communication tools. There's a number of questions here. Would it be possible for the district's nurses to see students online if the students wanted to do that? And this is from Mar Marsha Cox. Is this something we could, uh, could make available to them? The nurses, if needed, could actually work from home under current telemedicine guidelines. And the newest CMS 1135 waiver would allow for any new interactions to occur. I don't know if Aggie can answer. There's a few things we obviously have to look at, um, having people working from their home because when you're dealing with medical, it's HIPAA, and nurses have things they have to be very mindful of. I have forwarded that request to our lead nurse to be talking to the nurses. If we do go into a long-term closure, our nurses will be part of that support system, reaching out to kids, checking on our students who we do know to have medical risk at this time and working with families and being part of that emotional system that they already are on a daily basis in their schools. We'll look to see what we can do. Again, um, being mindful of that. We currently cannot use teletherapy and telemedicine in the school and the program we use for the Medicaid. It's allowed in the medical world, but it hasn't opened up or into the Medicaid and the public schools program. I do know they're looking at that now, but it hasn't passed our legislation looking at those practices that we have for the programs we provide currently for our students within the school. But again, the nurses are there to be supported and they're going to do what they can to continue to support our mission. This is still from Marcia Cox. Will the Rachel's Challenge celebration scheduled for May 7th be moved to a different date? Again, without the crystal ball, I, I, I would say yes, potentially, but um, that's a celebration for the end of the school year, and we might not be in school still. So, and then we have to arrange where that would be and get permission and licenses and all of that. So, we'll look at that on a daily basis, and that would be the goal to have a great celebration and welcome people actually back. But we'll just, we'll just that will be fluid, and we'll keep. This is Dr. Marcia Cox. Will specific services outlined in a student's IEP be carried out? As communicated earlier, we do have the legislation requirements under our several laws, actually, but the legislation does talk about that. We have received a lot of guidance. As you know, this is the first time in our history regarding the situation when we are in and set of laws that guide how we provide services are happy to be looked at very openly. We will be providing services. We, we do come in to support the general education platform, and so that's where we're working with those teachers at this time, looking at the accommodations, modifications. As we roll out at this time, our special educators who work with students that are providing alternative services or what we call related services, We'll be providing, again, information to parents on how they can reinforce, work with them, activities. And then if this does turn into a long term, it is our intent to be able to begin looking at how we're offering those options for families, whether it be through a teletherapy platform using Zoom, if that's what the parents want, we're here to support. And again, what parents want, we're trying to be very mindful of that as well. This is still Marcia Cox. Would it be possible to use the school buses and drivers to deliver lunches to children whose family can't make it to the pickup location because of their work schedules? I have an email to 
to Ann Faith, who is our food service supervisor, and we are going to have further discussions on that. I know that uh, each site has to be identified. Um, that process uh, began probably at least a week to 10 days ago, knowing that this, this was coming. Uh, so we'll have to figure out the requirements in regards to actually dropping meals at residences versus an actual determined site like the church out in Desert Hills or a school location. Could a site be a, a, a bus stop? Mm -hmm. Will the counselors still be able to help students apply for college? The counselors are working to be a support system, and they will be looking at how they can have office hours for students, guiding them on this continuum of services as well. So they will be looking at what their normal jobs are and how they can make that accessible to support students. And then we're also looking at how they can, again, as if this continues long term, support students and families socially and emotionally at this time as well. We're still on Marcia Cox. Will any of the clubs be able to meet virtually using distance technology? But school clubs, I think that's a great idea. I, I actually saw an online post from Key Club who used Zoom to me. I think so. that's a, I've, I've heard from advisors that the students are really reaching out um, to them. And so I think that's a great idea. And um, as I've talked to teachers, for many of them, it sounds like the Key Club advisor has it together, but for many of them it's let us get what we're doing and then let us get ready to roll about the next step. So I think that's something for sure that they could look at doing. If the district is discouraging people going, if the district is discouraging people to go to school properties, will there be any increased security at each school? Yes, yeah, so right now the doors are, are locked, the gates are up, but not at this time. Um, for those employees reporting to work each day, will their temperature be taken before entering the property using a thermal scan thermometer? Yes. So not at this time. The next questions are from Wendy Moore. Are there going to be set daily hours for students to log in to participate? Um, in talking to teachers, we have talked about having rolling office hours so that students who need help and support um, could access it at multiple hours during the day, and that even if teachers did meet virtually with students, that it would also be recorded so they can go back and watch it. And so, um, yes, there will be some sort of set hours. Um, that maybe there's something to tune in, but we want to make sure that it's accessible for um, as much of the time as possible. So there's not just, if we're looking at high school algebra, the, the only time you could talk to your teacher is from 8 to 9. You could potentially call multiple high school algebra teachers throughout the day to talk to them about algebra or other things. No. Did you say that they would be recording? It could be. Okay. So all I would ask is that none of those recordings with our students be submitted to any 
for any reason to any uh, outside organization, and I don't want to name any that might be on the front of your computer, but you get my drift. Yes. I don't want it to be used for something else. The teacher, like with the student. Right. Well, I don't know. That's what I was asking. I was assuming that, that with students in them. Well, I don't know what kind of interaction is going to take place, so right. I don't know what is going to happen. I just don't want it to be submitted for an assignment from a teacher for something else they may be doing or, or looking to do. That's all. Because I, I would want everybody to know that in, in advance. That would, so are you talking, are you talking about if a student, if a teacher is a student teacher and are you talking about to universities? Right. To whatever their, their. So that, to that, that would still be the same as if there's ever recording of a student, you still are required to get parent permission. Okay. So that would be no different. Okay. Um, and so we have a number of student teachers with us right now um, and they've had very clear um, what what there's they're not even asking that there's any recording going on but should that happen they would still be required to have just like if they record in the classroom their assignment they would still have that same parental permission that does not change and that's from the university in order to do that okay. so so an approval doesn't last for like a, a whole class it's like a day a specific day uh, it's usually for the semester so we're in a semester so so there's my point. So if we're in the semester and somebody does have permission to video their class, what I don't, and I don't know how Zoom works or the platforms mm -hmm. we're considering, but I don't want somebody's family, home, background, whatever is going on, to then be submitted. Because it's a different, that's fine. I, I, can, I, I okay. have no problem because that's a different information. Okay. We're looking at teachers. Okay. Um, what will parents be responsible for doing with their students? And what is happening with students who don't have online access? Will there be any tutoring available? What is going to happen with seniors and graduation? We don't know that. Yes, we don't know that, uh, and we are still working on it. The next question is from Susan Bolecki. It says, do schools not fall under the eight-week 50-plus gathering? How can we handle gatherings of less than 50 people in a school setting? I'm not quite sure what it's referring to. Well, the only question that was submitted to me that because a particular staff is larger than 50, how could they ask them to report to work? And that was in, in regard to their reporting to their individual workstation, so they are not in a gathering of, of any type. And then the last question that I have right now is from Carol Nowakowski, and it says, because it was cutting out, can staff get clarification as to what the district and governing board's understanding of the intent of the legislative bill that was signed Monday by Governor Ducey? There's some clarification needed and questions from staff over who can turn in the work from home agreement and what was actually required of staff members who turn in from the document, who turn in the document. Yeah. And so, I mean, it could have been signed since we started our meeting at 4 o'clock, but I, <laughs> no. Yes. But not signed. The work agreements, and so... Um, was that in the legislation? No. It, I don't recall that being. I thought that was internal. It's internal. So... Yeah. I think that will point to administration if they have questions for clarification. Yes. 
There is some clarification needed and questions from staff regarding who can turn in work from home agreement and what is actually the requirement of staff members who will turn in the document. For the board's information, um, we have a lot of staff that are also want to come in for a couple hours and work and also work from home. So what we're saying is if you're planning on working from home, you need to do the agreement. Basically what the agreement clarifies is that you need to be available, you need to be answering, you know, following up with your commitments for work. And then um, uh, it's really, it's pretty simple. And so I don't really understand the concern about that. I think that we've clarified that pretty well with our principals today in our meeting. And so they will be able to get those answers. I don't know if they had the opportunity to get them from their rentals after the meeting because we didn't finish before noon. So, as far as who can work from home, I think we all, any work that, that can be done from home, certainly principals are working with their staff to do that. Um, but I think that the bigger question in the legislation is after the 30th, can we bring people in for any reason? So. Uh, I have a couple questions. Um, well, maybe just one to start, and then I won't have all of the time. Uh, so I think tomorrow is the end of the 15-day, uh, I forget what the slogan is, but the slow your, you know, everybody stay inside for 15 days. Isn't tomorrow the end of that? I'm sorry? Yeah, blunt the curve, it, flatten the curve. It was slow the spread, I think, for the 15 days. That's what it was. Um, so, and there's been indication uh, from President Trump that he's going to open everything back up to the areas that have not been so devastated, like, you know, the three states. Um, and I know that you said you would bring us back in, but if the governor does in the next, you know, week or so decide to open things back up, um, do we have to wait to have that conversation on whether or not we're going to keep kids at home or not? Because my concern is, is that kids aren't staying home anyways. You know, they're out. Nobody's staying home. People are out and about. Um, I mean, those that are concerned might be staying home, but I've seen kids out and about all over the place. A lot of business is still open. So the idea that we would, if everything was opened back up, say, no, we're going to keep the school district closed. I'd rather not wait to kind of at least talk about that. Yeah, I think this is a good question. And sure. And we shared that legislation that would be appropriate for you to talk about that. And that is a good question. Right. <clears throat> That's just my, my concern is that, you know, there are a lot of people wanting their kids to be back in school, feeling that it's the safest place for their kids to be. And I know there's a lot of concern with people who need to work and now have this daycare issue that they have not had in years, you know, because they're, but they don't want to leave their, their children home alone with access to the internet or whatever. And so those questions have come up, although they didn't come up on the Facebook. I'm trying to confirm that the 15 day slowdown was issued 14 days ago. It doesn't feel like it's been that long, but I could be wrong. Are you, can you, do you have a source for that? I, I'm just curious because I'm trying to look it up and nothing's coming up that, so, about when it was. That's all. So if, if I can kind of guide this a little bit because we're nitpicking when, when it started. I, I just, I'm I, not nitpicking. I just wanted I, to know. But, 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 I, but I think I think there's a larger point there than when it's starting when it ends is, is that if if this gets pulled back and there is a likelihood that it'll get pulled back at some point we can't we can't do this indefinitely in, in my mind anyway and when it, if and when it does uh, what is that going to look like are we going to flip the switch right away are we going to wait I think and I think that's really the question. And I think March, I, I do March think 16th. March 16th was when it was announced? Okay. Yeah. So then it's... Okay. Well, I think. I mean, I, this is from whitehouse.gov, so I think. Okay. So we're now eight days into it. 
And I think, I mean, of course I'm open to suggestions on this, and I think our board should be flexible and our district should be flexible, hoping for a best-case scenario that, um, that we're cleared and okayed by the best medical experts, to, that we're okay to start back sooner. Um, I do think on the other end of things, it's appropriate for our community to be prepared for this to last the duration of the fourth quarter. And it sounds like our, our district has made both those types of short-term plans and long-term plans. Well, the short-term plan, I don't think, that's why I asked the question, because if it was opened back mm -hmm. up, the short, there is no short-term plan to come back. So I just wanted to kind of understand what that would look like. I understand that there's staff that would not want to come back. I totally get that. Um, but I don't know that that's the overwhelming majority of the staff um, or the, the, the students and the parents. So anyway. We'll have more information. And of course we can talk about that at a later date, but I just know that it was announced this morning that this is now a consideration, but I don't, of course that can all change mm -hmm. if we wake up tomorrow and there's five cases in Havasu. So That's true. I understand that it's fluid. Um, Oh, um, Mr. Yes, Mr. Gardner, when we were talking about um, the summer opportunities that were being brought up, um, I know that you and I have talked a little bit about the SMART program and how beneficial I thought that was um, just in years past for un incoming freshmen. Um, and so just as an idea, um, that might be something if we do end up having special summer sessions to sort of shore up the weaknesses that this has caused for our students, that might be a model for those for the students that are that are that want to participate in that program, I think it would still have to be optional, of course. Um, but it might be something that we could target the particularly vulnerable grades, which to me are seventh graders, er, rising seventh graders, and rising, rising ninth graders, because they haven't just had this disruption, but they're also going to be starting a new school next year. And so that might be something to consider. Did anybody else have any ideas or? comments that they wanted to share? Well, I just want to remind, I'm especially talking to people who are watching um, online, if you've ever done, been part of any kind of a change initiative, no matter how small or how, how large, there's never a change ever that does not need to be tweaked. You start down the road and you think, oh, everything, I've got it all in place, I've thought of everything, and all of a sudden you take a big right turn or big, because it's not working, so you make adjustments. So we mentioned how fluid this um, situation is. The staff has, has put something together <laughs> on Monday of this week, and they're already implementing it. And parents, if you think that this is written in stone and then we tell you it's going to be something else, you're going to be frustrated. Um, the staff will be frustrated, too, if something's not working. So just let's all be in this together. Again, take that big breath Mr. Madison mentioned. Um, but just, ex just expect it. You know, what's the, what, did, what did Betty, Betty say in that movie? Um, put, put your seat belts on. It's going to be a bumpy ride. That's what I'm predicting. Um, and we're, we're going to do the best we can. And, um, we're all in this together. That's, a, that's an excellent point. I, I would relate to a conversation I had in a grocery store line recently. I, I, was, in, I was in line, and, and it was in the end in one of our local grocery stores, the end checkout stall, and there was pallets of water stacked up next to it, gallons. And 
people would come by and they'd try and grab three or four, and the poor cashier at the end kept turning around and saying, I'm sorry, you can only have two. You can only have two. You can only have two. And I, and I looked, at the, looked at the young man behind me, and he was in his 20s and, and zipped up track jacket on and everything else on a, on a Sunday. And, and I said, you know, there's an entire lake out there full of water. <laughs> and uh, he, he kind of looked at me funny. I said, all you have to do is boil it for about 20 minutes, and you're, you're good to go. And, and, and he says, wow, that's really out-of-the-box thinking. Well, I, I ignored the third-grade science class, missed information there. And, and, and I looked at him, and, and, and here's the takeaway. This is what we all need to understand. We're all in the box together <laughs> because we really and truly are. And, and, so, and so because we're all in the box together, things change, things morph. Um, you know, the jokes aside uh, about toilet paper and everything else, this is unplanned, it's unexpected, and people will react to it in different ways. And that includes uh, elected officials at the federal, state, uh, county, and, and even local level. And so when we say fluid, we mean things will change on a dime, and we just kind of have to roll with that punch. And remember, we're all in the box together on this one. Can I ask again what our plans are for computers for the kids, or will that be discussed only when, if it uh, goes on for longer? Yes. Um, so in terms of um, distributing uh, computers to students, at this point we made the decision not to distribute to students. Um, those students who have uh, had them, obviously, and can access it, that would be fine. Uh, if it goes longer, we may open that, that discussion back up. But our, our issue as a district is that well, there's a couple of issues, but the main one being we don't have enough computers to provide for every single student, and so there would need to be some prioritization. We have discussed already that our seniors have priority, so we will, for any senior who needs a computer to take home, we'll distribute to them. And then talked about with the high school separately moving down by grade levels um, as needed for students who need to be, who are failing classes or who need to be able to complete courses. And so that's where we are right now. The flashcards would be awesome. So will you, will you communicate to me when, if you feel like we might have a need so that we can start collecting computers or money or whatever we need because we're uh, more than willing to do uh, uh, let, me, let me take that one step further. Okay. Because because collecting the computers is a good idea, but if you if you wanted to bring them by my shop, I'll wipe them out so there's no data on them. Um, and we've done this with the district in the past where we've cycled computers through our shop um, into the school district. And if you're going to donate a computer, if you think that, that, that you know a child who might need a computer, bring it by and we'll wipe it out and get it to the district because the district has – the site-wide Windows 10 license that they can use to put on there, and uh, that way we're all within the confines of, of good and kosher. And the last thing we want is for somebody's social security number or bank account information that might be on their computer to get out in the wrong way. Thank you. So yeah. should I at least tell people to um, that they're ready to collect computers or just hold off? I, I'm just going to step in here because I don't think it's appropriate what you're doing right now. I don't want to be offensive, but um, this is not – you're asking for somebody to give you direction to take to the COVID – have a COVID-19 task force, and I, I don't think that's appropriate in this work session to ask her on the spot um, to give you direction. You're – you haven't been given authority from the president of the board or from this board to be the representative on that task board for the school district, and you're putting us in a very awkward position right now. I don't agree. This is an open platform for discussion, and she's asking a question about the needs that our district faces. And if the answer is we're not sure what our needs are at this time or we're not even sure if we're going to need the service that's being offered, then I think that that's an appropriate answer to give and receive. And it's, it seems like she's 
willing to receive that interest. She just asked her if she should ask for donations. She just she, asked our That's right. She's trying to assess the need. To put our superintendent in. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I'm not representing anyone. I'm just talking as a person. If, if anyone feels like, and whether it's the superintendent or anyone feels like we should collect them, I will be willing and able to help in that process. I'll just put that out there. I think that's a good way. And I, I did kind of. She did, yes, yeah, she yeah. did ask me prior, me prior to the meeting if, if it would be okay for her to say that this is something that's available and would we like to. to and use I it. did also let Mrs. Roman and indirectly Mrs. Rasayal know that I'm on this task force just as an individual. I did not say school board member and at any case. But it would be completely okay for you to represent yourself as a school board member because you are. That doesn't give you any extra decision-making power right. because you are still an individual, right. but there wouldn't be anything wrong right. if you are identified anyway, clearly as a school board there, member. If anyone wants it, please let me know. Yeah. I think um, people who are listening are now going to be thinking about donating computers, which uh, we have accepted in the past through Mr. Madison's um, willingness to take them and wipe them. That's a yes. huge, important part of it. And so... Uh, we definitely do not want people bringing them to us. Okay. I would just channel them through him if that came up. Since he's and, yeah. and, and we've actually historically, and I'll call the nonprofit, the 501c3 that, that we've worked with in the past, uh, so that we can actually get a donation letter put together and so on. Do you want to say your address? Here? Uh, we're at 2180 McCulloch Boulevard. Uh, we're across the street from Sam Shooter's. Sam's Guns now, I guess, is, he's changed the name. But, but we're, we're across the street from there, and if you park around the backside, we, our door is ADA compliant, accessible, and has a nice little push button on it to get you in. But I would also caution you, we don't know how long this is going to last. We don't know what the actual needs are out there. Um, and so maybe what we should do is we should look at this as we can, we can see if we can funnel some computers into the district by that program and let the district decide whether they eventually wind up in a classroom or with a student. Sure. I think that makes sense that if at all that's the only way we would do it. Thank you for that and thank you for offering your services to, to wipe the computer. Connected computer and technology. I'm not going to sing the jingle. I am just going to make uh, one last point that, you know, I know that this is a school district and we're here to talk about the kids, but um, the risk is for our 60 and over population, and there hasn't been a lot of talk in our community about that population at all, and those are the ones that tend to be shut up in their homes right now because they are afraid. So I'm just going to say uh, to anybody who's watching and everybody in the room that if you know a senior, um, reach out and especially ones that are alone, who've lost, you know, a spouse or who live here alone without family. So I've got two that I've, I'm keeping my eye on in addition to the one that lives with me. Um, but that population is at risk right now, too. So maybe your group would like to reach out to them as well. Oh, we are doing various things. Thank good. you. And that's very good. A good effort. Any other comments on this topic? I did have one question. We have a um, legal training that's scheduled for Thursday morning. Um, I have communicated with Costa Henry about that, and um, she's not sure she's still going to receive um, instruction from her boss about whether it's better to meet in person or digitally. Um, but I just wanted to gather input from you. Would you like to meet in person on Thursday, or would you like to meet electronically, or would you like to postpone? I would like to postpone. Okay. We don't have a primary, so there's not an urgent need to have it right now in light of everything just because we don't have a primary for the election, so there's more time. We do have a little lead in time, that's yeah. true. I would like to postpone. What do you think, John? I have no fear either way. <laughs> All right. Well, it sounds like 
I could go either way as well, but um, if, if the majority would like to postpone them, we can do that. I can go either way, too, but it just seems like there's so much to do right now. It would be best to let the district use the time. We do all have other things on our mind right now. I would, I would agree with that. I will, I will see what TASCA thinks and then get back with, with everyone if that's okay. Okay, so next on our agenda, oh, do I have a motion to close discussion on this item? Do we need to do that? Oh, so right. session. I don't need a motion. Okay. Um, next up on our agenda is 3.2, it's Educational Advancement Policies, GCI, uh, and this is a review of something that we talked about at our last board meeting. Um, I'm sorry, not our last board meeting, our February board meeting, I think. Um, now my question is, do we want to continue? We're almost two hours in the meeting. Do we want to continue? This was kind of an optional, depending on how time went. Do we want to continue with this, or do we want to save this for another time? Um, I don't mind either way. I'm good either way. I think we should ask Mrs. Festivago uh, how urgent this is from her point of view. I wouldn't mind, I mean, like I said, we, we haven't even been here for two hours, so I don't mind. Um, I think if my intuition is correct, I think that Mrs. Cohen is the one who has really the bulk of the items to present. So do you think you could present in like a half an hour or so? Is that sufficient time to say what you want to say on this topic? Well, I, I, I wasn't looking to present, and I see that there's a presentation available, and I guess this kind of goes to my concern in the first place because the policy was presented and, you know, the policy is from the board. And the staff generally presents things that they're working on or whatever, and I get that, but there was no indication that this is what's going to happen. So now here we're going to be presented a presentation that I've had no advance warning of or so that I could go through. Maybe it answers my questions. Maybe there's no need, but I didn't put together a presentation. I have specific questions about... Um, Maybe presentation was the wrong word. I didn't mean like that you had a PowerPoint ready. I just meant like you were the one who had the bulk of the things yes, that I had the that. concerns. Yes. I had the concerns. And it was at the end of a long, you know, I think it was at the end of a long meeting that we had already had that evening. It was a very emotional meeting anyways. Um, so I don't know if you want to do a presentation, how many pages it is. Okay. Well, and my questions might not even be about changes. They may have been about existing language that was brought back over. It's not just about the blue. <laughs> it's just because it was put in front of me because I haven't had the opportunity to read every policy in our policy manual book. Um, but I'll tell you the biggest concern that I had was that there was a requirement um, for the staff of each site to vote on the review board and then the principal would approve the review board or the member that was going to be part of the review board. And I'm seeing things go that way a lot where everybody wants to have buy-in and be part of the decision-making process. But when you're talking about professional development, that's that's a big concern of mine because as I'm reading through the professional development that's out there, there's a worldview attached to everything. And, you know, we made that part of our mission um, in guiding principles, and we still haven't had that conversation. So now the idea that um, we're going to have staff members picked by popularity, uh, approved by a principal, and then be the ones in charge of vetting uh, the professional development opportunities is very concerning to me. So that's my biggest problem. So, May I say something? And things may have changed since I'm no longer an employee of the district. But since the, the 70s, when I came on board, um, there was always a staff member at each school um, who, and you would have have some who wanted, they, they, for whatever reason, I would never want to be on that committee, but they were extremely organized. Sure. They were rule followers. They were, no, 
this is not going to be easy. Not everything is allowed. And that's just my experience. And I've talked in most of the schools, or I've worked at much of the schools in the district. And they tended to stay on this committee as the representative of their school. And the, pro the, pro the procedure would be the teacher would submit something, um, and that would be taken to the committee, and the committee would say yes or no. And it got to be, over time, it, it's kind of like an institutional uh, memory. Well, the rep would say, well, you know, this is not going to get by the review board. You know, we don't, you, you can't get credit uh, for salary advancement for this class. And it would be nasty, it wouldn't be pretty, and probably the rep would go ahead and take it anyway, and it would be turned down. Now, that's just my experience that, that I have had. Now, maybe things have changed, um, but I, I, I never ever saw a, 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 a class that got accepted um, that was something that wasn't within the realm of uh, how students learn, curriculum, motivating children, I mean, all, discipline, I mean, things that you would, th those, th those are the kinds of things. Well, I understand that. Yeah. Um, so you were a principal uh -huh. elementary and high uh -huh. school. And when I got to the high school, the, the, the person who had been on the committee for years remained on there. Now, later on, that changed, and the, the next person was not organized and lost a teacher's paperwork, and the teacher didn't make a raise the next year. I mean, so it's very, and what I, I've been thinking about your concerns a little different, perhaps in a different way, is that there could be, I don't know that there's anything written in the policy about the kind of person that the, the principal would, would accept or even possibly recruit, because it has to be a special kind of person. It's not just anybody who can do that job. There's, I don't think there's anything you know, the principal can't, can't just look at this as, oh, this, oh, good, I've got someone who can do this. The principal needs to be very careful about who is selected for that position, in my opinion. So maybe that would um, t take care of some of, of Mrs. Cohen's well, concerns. No, my point is, is that the pr principal has lost control of that decision, and that's my problem. It's of, of what decision? Of choosing the person that's going to represent the site. Oh, I... Oh, has that it's changed? Voted on by it's, staff. It's voted on by staff. Yes, per old policy and new policy, it actually says at the sites um, that the sites uh, vote and the principal then approves. At the administrator level, the superintendent appoints. Appoints. I I will agree with Mrs. Cox. This is a very thankless committee. You basically get to tell people that the classes that they want to take didn't meet what the requirements are. And so um, the, the committee has been that same committee for a very long time. I, we just cleaned our offices, and everything is all over the place. And I'm looking at people who signed my papers in 2003, and they're still the same people that are on the committee. Um, however, if the direction of the board is that they just want the principal to appoint, there's not going to be that. That is, is something that, when it comes back uh, in front of the board, that could easily be changed if that is the wish of the board. What was the reason for making? Uh, I don't. I don't recall that the staff ever voted on it during my time. What? what why was that change made? It wasn't. So, so the reality, uh, Mrs. Cox, is sometimes in policy is not what actually <laughs> happens in practice. Okay. And so um, as, as Mrs. Cohen is reading, policy as it's written is not actually policy as it's practiced. And so while it's really easy for me to say staff members are not really voting on this, principals are picking, that's what policy says. Policy says staff members are choosing. And so I agree, our policy should be what we are doing. And so if the board's direction is they would rather staff or principals pick, which is the case for most of our committees, I think that's well within reason to adjust the policy for the future. I'm, I'm from the private sector, and, and this is where I start scratching my head. Because I'm used to seeing an administrator in charge of what professional development 
and, and, and so on happens. I understand we're, we're outlining money and policy, but why is it necessary to have a committee of employees, and I'm going to put it that way because, again, I'm talking about the private sector model, a committee of employees get together to decide what constitutes professional development and what doesn't. this historically because as you can see it was in our policy um, before before right it's also in pretty much all of these policies from every other school um, the committee serves two purposes practically they serve as a liaison so there, there used to be a paperwork shuffle where people gave the their papers to the committee person at their site the, the person at their site held on to them as this is said, her person lost them. We've done away with all that. And now it, it comes to me. We pre-approve them. We, we basically bring them to the committee to say, are there things that you're concerned about? Are there patterns we see? Can we make recommendations? Uh, hey, this is a professional development that we're seeing. This, these are things. So for our purposes here, we are really trying to streamline where the collection site. There is no more someone's walking around with paperwork at a site for six months, which is what used to happen. Um, we are looking and we are checking the dates in my office. Um, we are asking the committees to serve as a communication measure. Please inform your staff at the site, this is what professional development is. This is the due dates. This is what we need. We're really, the committee serves as a communication from our office. And so... Um, the directions have now shifted, and I've taken on more of that administrative role because I would agree with you that that there was a lot of decision making. So at this point, it has shifted, but the committee still exists in the sense of communication. So, so without me going through and reading three policies cobbled into one big giant one. Does the new policy then address what you're explaining to me that you're green lighting what goes to the committee through your administrative position? Yeah. Can I ask a question though that's probably not in the PowerPoint? I was I well, I stopped getting them a long time ago, but professional development always came through Brad, so why is it now coming through you? Or not Brad, but I mean under you. It came from Michelle Yusuf, so, but now it's not. Or maybe I'm talking two different things. Okay. Professional development that the school district offers is still through Mr. Gardner's office. All this is is the mechanism that we give salary advancement to people who take coursework outside of their work hours. That is in our department, um, and we do the administrative work around that. And so this is outside of work hours. And so Mr. Gardner and I work very closely together, um, but this is not – Here's the areas you should be working at. We are really looking at coursework people are taking. Because it pertains to salaries. Because it pertains we have, we have to get that right. Yes. So the reason why um, we looked at this policy is to bring transparency around educational advancement by adding the amount of the advancement. That was really important to us. We wanted to say, here's the dollar amount you're getting in policy. And we wanted to increase the amount of uh, we wanted to increase that amount of the uh, educational advancement increase to reflect inflationary trends. So I looked through records. They are imperfect. Um, but in 1970-78, starting teacher uh, salary was $8,500, and the educational advancement was $525 for every 12 credits. In 0203, a starting teacher salary was $24,500, and the educational advancement was $750. And so... Now we're looking at starting salary of $36,000, and the increase is still at this time $750. In 06-07, um, an entry-level classified hourly wage was 765 
and the educational advancement was 35 cents an hour. So we wanted to look at that, that inflationary trend. We wanted to streamline the process and bring it in line with a stepless salary schedule. So remember, this policy was created around the time when we had the big chart and we had columns and rows. And so we just wanted to get rid of that. We wanted to move policy GCBA and GDBA to GCI. When I look at most school districts, it is within GCI. There's, it's all over the place, but most school districts have it within GCI. We wanted to provide clarity to staff how the process works, and we've started to do that in the past two years. We've shared the process in the staff handbook. We've shared it uh, through emails. I make calendar appointments when things are due. It's part of what the committee has done. Um, the Board of Review Committee has presented this year what the process looks like. It's really the first time that we've done that um, for as long as I've been here, but they had um, time where they showed this is what the process looks like if you want to get educational advancement. So this is the historic trends, um, and so you can see what um, this has uh, cost the district each year and how many people have applied for um, an educational advancement. Um, we were frozen for a number of years. I will say this was very, very problematic. Um, we had years where especially finding administrators was very, very difficult um, because you were, if you worked on your master's degree, you got nothing for it. And so that was a pretty difficult time. Um, and so you can see there's many more moves on the certified side uh, than the classified side, um, but those are the number of people who have applied each year for um, an advancement. And this doesn't mean people turning in credits. People could turn in three credits or six credits. This is the entire 12 credits to, to make an advancement. This is just other example policies. You can see that many of them use GCI. Um, some of them are in the regulation. Other of them, they have different uh, things. So um, we based our policies based on looking at what else was out there um, and still trying to, to stay true to what we had. Um, not reinvent the wheel, but stream, stream align the wheel. Okay, so some of the changes, specificity of language, um, reminder that employees will not earn educational advancement for professional development that occurs during work hours. So that's really what Brad is in charge of. So okay. we were really clear. If you're doing this during work hours, you don't get it. Reminder that employees are responsible for tracking their hours and their credits. This is a very big deal um, for teachers. Certification is important. And the more times we can say it, that they are responsible for this task, we will say it. Um, addition of recertification uh, section, working to remind certified staff of their role in maintaining hours. Uh, this is professional staff development. Again, clarity of language. We try to use the same terms throughout. So we used credits, hours, certified. So we just tried to repeat all of the language in, instead of all of the different types of language. Moved to bullets rather than just a mixture of text and bullets. There was like big, huge paragraphs and then text. So we tried to just lay everything out in one big laundry list. Before you had to tell the superintendent or the superintendent's designee that you were enrolling in a degree program. So if you wanted to get your master's, you would like write a letter and say like, I'm working on my master's. And so this is already done through the coursework request. People are telling us that they're working on coursework. And so it was, we, we deleted that because it was just extra work that nothing was done with. We inserted the amount of the increase into policy so that way changes to that amount will require board approval um, and changes to board of review. Uh, the biggest change was changing the number of meetings uh, per year. Right now it says the months of the year that we have to meet, um, and we just said quarterly. We wanted to meet one more time a year just so that we could talk about uh, communication back and forth with the staff. Um, if there were any concerns, we just said quarterly, um, and we didn't have a month limiting us. For classified, you didn't mention the clarity of the appeal process. I think that's really important. That oh, sorry, yes. the board knows that they should appeal process. 
Yes, and so clarity of the, the appeal process. So we didn't, when I came into this position, we didn't quite know what the appeal process was, so we sort of made it up. Um, but we wanted to really make sure that the appeal process was clear and in policy. It used to be nasty. <laughs> well, it, 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 it's, still, it's still nasty, but now we can really point to, we would like to be able to point to this is what it looks like, and it's, it's, it's written down for you. Um, again, support staff removal of language referring to a salary schedule. Again, clarity of language using the same words throughout. Move to bullets. Um, we wanted to emphasize language around credits related to job growth. So in support staff, it's a little bit different. Teachers are pretty cut and dry. Um, support staff, we wanted to focus on it is about you earning credits that either transition you to you becoming an educator or is in line with what your position is because we do see people going to school um, and getting credits, but it is clearly to become something else that would never be in education. And so while we applaud that, we want to reward people who it's going to support their role within our institution, not for them to go out to work for somebody else. So that was one of my questions too. Um, for the support staff that wanted to get their bachelors mm -hmm. um, to, and, and I was really trying to understand the contact hours, um, educational exam, you know, 15, let me know if I got this right, 15 contact hours is one educational advancement, 360 contact hours are the max, mm -hmm. divided by 15 is yes. 24 educational advancement, okay. So this was another big concern because when I was president in 2017 and we had a meeting with ASU, one of the things on the list that we were assured was going to happen was that we were going to have a um, bachelor's degree for interested classified staff that wanted to become teachers. So, but either that has not occurred, the talks have fallen down, I don't know, but now we're going to pay for it, whereas before we were getting an agreement that was my understanding, although I was sick that day, so. You remember that day? But we're doing this before they get it. We're doing it along the way as they're. So if somebody is a classified and they want to go to ASU, and I don't know where we are with that program, again, because I haven't discussed it, but let's just say they're able to take that course from ASU, and then we're paying them until they get it, even though they're not paying out of pocket to get it. It would make sense to pay them after they got it, but why would you pay before? So we would only pay them after the 12 credits. So they'd have, they'd have same thing with everyone. They would have to finish the 12 credits, and then they get the bump. So every semester they attend school until they earn their bachelor's degree, in, in essence, because that's the baseline full full credit load, they get a bump. Mm -hmm. We do the same for a, a teacher working on her master's. Every 12 hours she gets a bump. We don't say you have to, we, we won't reward you monetarily until you get the master's. So it's kind of the same thing. But are we paying for them to increase the expertise? They have to pay for their own Okay. So if we have a guy working in on our AC and we want them to be higher educated, we're not paying for those courses for them to get that certification? So so I guess my question, knowing something about the air conditioning industry because of where we live. You have to have an EPA certification simply to handle the refrigerant to begin with. Are we hiring somebody to work on air conditioning then who does not have that certification and then 
paying them to get that certification? No, and so those are minimum. <laughs> so those are minimum. So it's still whatever is the minimum required for your job. If there was some, and I don't know what expertise there is in HVAC, but let's say we hired you as a tech and you went to go get XYZ certification that you didn't have after, you could earn educational advancement to make you more expert at that. But there are still minimum requirements for all of our job positions. You would need to meet those in order to be hired. Okay. And it says, I think the next line, oh, and maybe it actually doesn't even, it doesn't say that in there. Oh, it does. Um, add language in um, about credits from previous employment and payment by, by district. Uh, as we've audited files, we found that on occasion we've paid people for previous things that they've done, and so we wanted to very clearly say, if you did this in a previous life, we are not counting that. That is what your, that's how we figure your salary upon entry. It is not educational advancement. Um, again, add the language in about support staff earning teacher certificates, increase the amount into policy, changes to the Board of Review and clarity of the appeal process. And then these are just kind of the changes in procedure. So what's in purple is what used to be, and what's in white is what's new. And so I know that seems like so many changes, um, but so the coursework approval got, uh, form used to be uh, submitted directly to a member of the Certified Board of Review or the Classified Board of Review, and the submission was uh, the uh, submission was after they completed the coursework. Um, so that seemed a little bit strange to me because there was people who did the coursework and then we said, no, it doesn't count. Um, and so we've asked for the coursework approval form to be submitted to personnel for a pre-screen and it's submitted prior to taking the course. Um, and again, it goes straight to us. We do the work. There are not people walking around on eight different school sites with that. Um, the paperwork is, used to be reviewed three times a year. Um, now the paperwork is reviewed quarterly and there are not months attached. Verification and finally verification of coursework uh, and request for advancement certificates or official transcripts sent to personnel by June 30th for advancement for the following year. Uh, verification uh, of coursework and request for advancement sent to personnel upon completion for advancement uh, the following quarter as budget allows. Um, and so uh, we worked very closely with Mr. Murray this year, um, and there was a lot of hanging around of paperwork. Um, and so what we decided, and uh, we've been able to pay people the following quarter. Um, and so that's worked so far successfully. Um, it is not, in, that part is not in policy. Um, and so we've, we're, not, we're not promising that, but that is really, again, allowed for um, the bureau bureaucracy, like we're hanging on to this, we're just trying to get people through as we approve it um, and work clo more closely with uh, the business office. So another question that I had is, um, we're only requiring a C for educational advancement, and everywhere I've ever worked, it was done on a scale. You know, you were, re you know, you received full reimbursement or whatever the term was if you got an A, and a B, you know, 75%, a C, 50%. If you didn't get a C, you didn't get anything. So I don't know why, you know, a C is what's acceptable for educators when you're taking coursework in order to get advancement. So that would be a, a question that I would have. It seems like we would have a higher level expectation for our professionals than a C. And, and I would agree with that. Um, in general, only the only thing uh, is 
for a lot of graduate coursework, we're looking at a C is possibly an 85%. And so, um, you know, all of the different universities have different grading scales. Um, and so C is typically what is passing. Um, and so we spend a lot of time in my office with transcripts. Um, and we see C's as high as 87% in some cases. So um, that would be a concern to me to move it only with A's and B's. Uh, when I look at policies, because I did look at that, um, I would say most districts give credit through C's. There are definitely a couple of uh, districts that only give credit for A's and B's. Would it be possible to put credit into a percentage scale as opposed to uh, letter grade? So the only problem is we do 12, groups of 12 and 15. And so um, I don't know, you know, if you ended up with one C and the rest days. I, I, I don't know what the best recourse for that would be. I'll tell you my own, my own um, experience with college is I did have one professor who his policy was a C is average, and so almost everyone in this class is going to get a C unless you do really poorly or if you really wowed him. Um, so in that class, a C was considered a good grade and representative of very hard work. So I just want to throw that out there, that there are exceptions. There are people who work very hard and do learn a lot, which is the whole goal of this anyway, but still walk away with a C. Or just keep it simple. Passing, <laughs> passing to me is, you know, I mean, we, ho we would hope that it, these are we, these are educators and, and um, classified staff that we're talking about. I don't think that they're going to take a class and then just not take it seriously. I, I have faith in our staff that they are doing things to their best of, the best of their ability. And so that's one of the things that the committee does do a really good job of is because this is for educators one of the ways to increase their pay. And so we do look at, is, this, is that really a class? Is that really time? And so that is some very, that's something that they take um, pride in is, is this, is this something that people took time in? Is it something they, they had to already do before? Um, and so the committee, the committee really is helpful um, in sharing that information um, and in cases where, and, and we do a lot of looking that information up, um, but when they used to have the, the packets before, um, they did a lot of looking that up. And not that it was in judgment of everybody, but they, they are stewards of the district's money, um, sometimes to the extent that I'm like, I think like you're getting it if we don't spend it. Um, but um, they, they take it seriously and deadline seriously. Diana, Diana means it, that, that it can be ugly. And so some of the rules were relaxed. Of, this needs to make sense. If people are doing the work, let's reward them. But let's have a framework that is rewarding them, that we aren't breaking rules. Can I give you an example? Um, the, I'll get a, a good example, I think, a, a lot of programs like a, a master's degree or administrative certificate require that uh, you pass statistics. Well, there, there are people who actually <laughs> don't find that math is their best subject, and now they have to get through statistics. So uh, uh, when they do, they get a C. I think that's a very worthy accomplishment. That's just, now Mr. Madison, I'm sure, would have no problem passing statistics. The saying is, there are lies, there are damn lies, and then there are statistics. Okay, there you go, which is about the main thing you need to learn <laughs> from the class, in my opinion. No, I'm just joking. But no, it's just, uh, it's just an example. It's just an, a barrier. And they, but they do it. They get that C in there. That class. So I guess maybe, uh, because this will come back at the next board meeting, I'm assuming, or next regular board meeting. Uh, but I'd like to see examples of the last group that went through of what exactly professional development looks like because uh, I've been under the impression that it was what I was getting from Michelle Yuso that stopped like in 2017, I think I stopped getting those emails. But um, I, I would just like to have a better idea because I'm just concerned about um, 
I guess I'm always concerned. So I'd just like to see what that looks like. And, and I do still have the concerns about the transdisciplinarity. And I'll tell you, even though we're not going to discuss that right now, I will tell you that I feel like I've cracked the nut on what this is. So new knowledge, transdisciplinarity, is the new knowledge. It's new knowledge. Well, how do we get this new knowledge? So we're using the student leaders that we've been training for, what, 10 years now. There's been a real big push to train student leaders. And they are going to co-research with our behavioral scientists to produce the new knowledge required to solve the wicked problems. That's my assessment, but I can't wait till we talk about transdisciplinarity. I hope we talk about it before it's implemented in our school in any way, shape, or form. I do. I don't know if I can get a guarantee from anybody in this room, but it's been a concern since December. Unless we're already doing it and nobody wants to say. <laughs> I don't no. know. I think they just don't. I still don't understand what you mean by. I don't think anyone by that term. By the term transdisciplinary, I don't. I don't understand what you knowledge. mean by. It's new knowledge. It's not inter multi. It's new. It's above all of that. It is a new knowledge. Can you I'm give, telling you. Can you give us an example of new knowledge? Something that doesn't exist. Okay. It's knowledge that's new. It's going to be created from the students, from the, from the student leaders that we're creating. This new knowledge is going to be created in conjunction with the students. That's what makes it new. And it is going to solve the wicked problems. Those are the unsolvable mm -hmm. problems. I mean, I'm sure you've heard of the wicked problems. I haven't. Well, I guess I'm just researching too much, but I'm telling you this is going to be an issue that's going to come up and it's going to be confronted because ASU is wrapped in it big time. I mean, this is, um, they were just, um, what organization, HASTAC? Do you have, are you familiar with HASTAC? We don't have IT here, do we? I bet they are. But um, ASU was um, named... This in, oh, ASU selected as institutional partner for renowned transdisciplinary organization, and this was in December of 2016. So it's all been ramped up, and it's coming through Mary Lou Fulton, and it will come. That's why I think we should talk about it. And I know it's hard to understand, but I came up with my answer because you asked me to explain it. So that, that's my explanation. Okay. And I, I honestly thought that at this work session you were going to kind of just um, lay out your objections. I did. At this work session? To what? My objections? I, I, I thought you were going to kind of expand on what, what you meant by transdisciplinary, what, why you think it's a bad thing, why you think it's detrimental to professional development. Like, in, in the context of discussing this policy change, I thought that that's what we were going to talk about here today. And I'm not saying I want to now because this meeting has been well, two and a half hours long. Because nobody's, <laughs> nobody's done any research on it. No, so, I thought you were uh, going to say your piece about it. And maybe it would change someone's mind or maybe or maybe not. Maybe they don't even have their minds made up. Um, but this will, as far as I know, be on the agenda for the next board meeting, correct? As a voting item. Yes. Right. Okay. So... I guess my question at this point is, are there any other questions from the board members specific to this policy that you would need answered before you could vote at our next board meeting? Yes. Okay. I would like to know from Mr. Murray and Superintendent Sire uh, how they feel this dovetails and if this is a complete policy that will solve existing problems in a way that we're not going to dump this in Dr. Stone's lap six months to a year from now. I'd also like to have Dr. Stone's input on the policy because this isn't something that, that we're doing with her at this point. This is something we're going to do to her. And I, and I, I really think, you know, we've, we've got this really cool opportunity where we've got our current superintendent and our incoming superintendent uh, that are both here now and getting her input on the policy I think would be very valuable. I agree with that. I, I just, I don't even know where, where to begin. I don't, when I go home and research wicked 
problems. I did go home after the last meeting and I looked up uh, transdisciplinary. And, um, and but the idea of our, as a, as a school district, using student leaders that we have, and I mean, Havasu is not exactly an intellectual bastion of, of development intellectually here, new research and science and humanities and all kinds of things. So we, we are not going to really be, be able to send our students out and work with people to develop these things. I just, I, I, I can't control, you know, what's happening. I understand. Yeah, so. I wasn't making this about transdisciplinarity. I, oh, I ended I, with it. I'm sorry. I didn't begin with that. I ended with it. I was wrapping up, oh. and I was answering uh, oh. President Roman's question at the last oh. meeting, can you explain it? Okay. So I have explained it in the most simple terms. I can explain it with data to back that up. But this is not the conversation for that. I went through my concerns, and I was not – I was – I said I was thinking about the professional development being the emails that I got from, you know, 2015, 16, and then 17. Well, I had concerns about that. And then as I go to ASU and I'm looking at what's free for professional development, then it brings on a whole other host of concerns. So I, I went through my concerns in this policy, um, and I was only ending with the transdisciplinary example. Okay. Okay. Because I don't want that to just go by the wayside. But is student leadership, is that the bridge? That's the bridge. That's the bridge right there. Yeah. It's the student leadership piece. In Canada, they have actually lowered um, the parental consent uh, to use children as co-researchers to nine. And there's a push to lower it here, too. So this is where they're going to develop this new knowledge. Um, and I hope somebody in the district, wink, wink, Brad, purchases the book that I <laughs> suggested so that the district has a copy of the $160 book that I purchased because um, I can't give mine up. It's all marked up. Um, and I'm not giving it up because I spent so much money on it. <laughs> I'm, not sure, I'm not sure that you can read from this platform, though, I'm not sure. I, I mean, I guess it's not that you're telling him he has to order it, but even suggesting that he order a book, I'm not sure that that's acceptable from this platform. Oh, okay. As a board member to give instruction to a director like that. Okay. Okay. Um, Superintendent Sire, at our January meeting, I did ask you if you were uh, supportive of this policy change, and you, you said that you were. Is that, has that changed, or...? Should we have in policy um, about that unknown? I mean, should we have a date? Is it already in there? Did I forget that? But we would want to do that during the budget time for the following year, not just arbitrarily because we've had a hiccup. Okay. Is it right there as budget allows down there, and then That's not right, but it has some sort of escape clause basically. Does does this expand the availability of professional development to staff? Are we are we are we? The reason for the question is: is are we now purposefully taking on more potential use of the system based on these changes?
And does that reward them when they hit the point that they are an educator? Does that reward them past the base salary? Yes, it would then go back to the base salary. So it's a pretty small window. It would be to support them as they're becoming an educator. And then the goal is that they would become educators. And so the increases would go away because they would go on to a teacher salary or a counselor salary. And so taking taking the clarifications and refinements out for a minute financially, because I think that's where the big concern here is, is that we, we don't want to open a floodgate. We want to reward employees, don't, don't get me wrong, but you also don't want to open up the floodgate. So there's a dichotomy there that you want to balance. So there in, could be a max. So in, in doing that, um, we're not going to have, you know, 225 out of 550 staff members all of a sudden show up and go, hey, by the way, we want to do X. But what if they do? I mean, what if we have 100 people? Have we looked at those costs? If we have 100 classified staff that decide they want to become teachers because there's an incentive now to do that and there's an opportunity at ASU? So we have to back up. So every classified staff member now could become a teacher. Every classified staff member now um, can earn up to 72 credits. Um, they, uh, the reality is most of our classified staff members are nowhere near that. This would really only apply to a classified staff member who has more than 72 credits all the way up through a bachelor's degree. So this is a very small amount. I actually, um, it's hanging on my computer. We have 29 staff member, classified staff members who have more than 60 credits. So we have classified staff members who have zero. So they could all go get this currently, um, but they would max out when they get to 60 credits. So if you are a paraprofessional and you have a high school degree, um, you are able to get this educational advancement. Right now, it's just you max out around your sophomore year, your second year in college, and you're still going to school to become a teacher um, or a counselor, and you're not getting any more educational advancement. Um, so that is really the only group that it affects, because currently, as it stands, we already allow for a maximum of 60 or 72 credits for um, our classified staff. So basically, you're talking about at worst, for somebody in that situation, about $4,700 a year is, is what we're talking about at additional payroll cost. And, and it would, the, the goal would be that it is for a short period of time, um, and it would be between I'm a paraprofessional to I am a teacher. That would be the goal. But they currently already, if you're a paraprofessional and you have 12 credits, you can do this. You just max out when you get to 72. We're asking to go all the way through a bachelor's degree, so more like 120 credits. Any other questions? Mr. Murray, what does this currently cost our district every year? She just turned it up there. Yeah. Go back. To yeah, go back. Go back. I want to see. There it is. 118. That's a five-year five year total, so we're talking. 9,000 last year for certified and 1,700 for. 17,000. 100. 1,700. Oh, 1,700, yes. 1,800, 1,792. So, so basically we're talking about 22 to 25,000 a year. Alrighty then. All right. Um, are there any updates or announcements? <laughs> just, just to, uh, welcome, Dr. Stone again. Yes. yes. Welcome. Thank you. Oh.
Condolences to her and her family. Right. Are you going to tell us about the future dates, meeting dates, and just because of the COVID? Do you have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Yes. 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 Yes.